Remember that rocket part that is supposed to impact the far side of the moon next month and how we all thought it was from a SpaceX launch? Well, it turns out it's not. New calculations and observations revealed it's from a Chinese launch. Plus, we have several other launches to cover today, as well as news about asteroid 16 Psyche and some cool craters in Wyoming. And after all those stories, we have an interview with Katherine Hess from MIT and NASA's test mission. All of this now, right here on The Daily Space. I'm your host, Dr. Pamela Gay. And I am your host, Beth Johnson. And we are here to put science in your brain. A new mission is expected to launch this year to go and examine an interesting asteroid, 16 Psyche. That asteroid is thought to be made almost entirely of iron, suggesting that it could be the core of a larger body that either never fully formed or was somehow destroyed in a collision. There was even one article running around last year that estimated the value of Psyche's metals as somewhere around 10 quintillion dollars. No, seriously, someone wrote that. However, before all those wannabe asteroid miners get their hopes up, new research published in JGR Planets now suggests that Psyche is less metallic than previously thought. While light reflecting off the surface of the asteroid does suggest a darkness that belies a metallic composition, measurements of the mass and density do not match up with that hypothesis. In fact, per the press release, quote, the way Psyche's gravity tugs on neighboring bodies suggests that Psyche is far less dense than a giant hunk of iron should be. So if Psyche is indeed all metal, it would have to be highly porous, like a giant ball of steel wool with nearly equal parts void space and solid metal, unquote. Lead author Fiona Nichols Fleming explains, what we wanted to do with the study was see whether it was possible for an iron body the size of Psyche to maintain that near 50% porosity. We found that it's very unlikely. For Psyche to have remained that highly porous, the internal temperature after formation would have had to be a rather cool 800 Kelvin. Otherwise, the iron would still be malleable, and the asteroid's own gravity would have collapsed all the pore space and created a smaller, denser object. At 250 kilometers across, Psyche couldn't have cooled that quickly. Additionally, any impact that could have added that porosity back in by splintering the asteroid would also have heated it up above that same 800 Kelvin threshold, meaning that poor state wouldn't last either. This new model suggests that Psyche may be hiding a rocky component that is making the asteroid less dense overall. So why does it look so very metallic as seen from Earth? My new favorite word, ferrovulcanism. Iron spewing volcanoes. They could exist. They could have been on Psyche, and they would have moved internal iron to the surface, coating it like a cake pop. Well, I was looking forward to the mission to Psyche before today, but now I'm really looking forward to it. It should launch later this year and arrive at 16 Psyche in 2026. We'll bring you updates as we get them and cover that launch when it happens. Of course, not everything interesting is happening out in space. Back on Earth, we've still got mysteries to solve. One of the more frustrating things about our planet is old structures gradually get filled in and hidden beneath layers of plants, dirt, and all the material that is carried in the wind. On a personal level, my lawn is determined to consume and hide stepping stones. On a more global level, we see ancient cities lost beneath millennia of sedimentation and dinosaur bones lost into what have become mountains. Trying to understand the history of our world is made a whole lot more complex because the details of our past are literally filled in with dirt. 
worlds like the Moon and Mercury show their entire history on their surface. And even Mars has billion-year-old features still well-defined on its face. These ancient features allow us to understand that planets and moons are experiencing regular rockfall. And when large enough asteroids hit a world, we see radial streaks of material in smaller craters that are caused by the excavated material going up and coming back down. These secondary craters and radial streaks are easy to make out on other worlds, but had never been found on Earth until now. Researchers examining 10 to 70 meter craters in a layer of Permian era rock and soil discovered these 200 and million year old features are aligned and shaped in the specific ways that indicate these are not the result of a broken up rock falling in chunks from the sky, but instead are Earth's first example of our planet hitting itself. Following the physics points toward these Wyoming craters resulting from the formation of a 50 to 65 kilometer diameter crater that is deeply buried somewhere near the Wyoming-Nebraska border. When we look at the moon and other rocky objects and see a world of craters, we are seeing what happened here. Our world just likes to fill in its craters and hide its scars. After the break, we have launches. Launches and more launches. Stay tuned. On February 14th at 0029 UTC, an Indian PSLV rocket launched the EOS-4 radar, radar satellite into a sun-synchronous orbit from the first launch pad at the Satish Dhawan Space Center in southern India. This was the 54th PSLV launch since the first one in 1993. Let's watch the launch. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Plus five seconds. Safalta Poon Uthapan, PSLV C52. Seven seconds. Seven Seventeen minutes after launch, the fourth stage of the launch vehicle separated EOS-4 and two other small sats into orbit. EOS-4, also known as RESAT-1A, is a C-band synthetic aperture radar satellite. Like similar satellites, it will be used for agriculture, flood mapping, and forestry. It will complement other remote sensing satellites operated by India, such as CardoSat and ResearchSat. Another satellite on PSLV C-52 was INS-2TD. It is another type of remote sensing satellite, this time with a thermal camera. This sensor is useful for surface temperatures and differentiating between different types of vegetation, such as crops and forests. INS-2TD is a technology demonstrator trying the sensor out for the future INS-2B satellite. The other CubeSat on PSLV C-52 is InspireSat-1, a student satellite built as a collaboration between four universities in India, the USA, Singapore, and Taiwan. It will investigate the atmosphere of both the Earth and the Sun. Its payload is funded by NASA and is called the Miniature X-ray Solar Spectrometer 3, or MIN-XSS-3. The experiment will investigate the soft X-ray the experiment will investigate the soft X-rays released during solar flares, specifically how they interact with the Earth's ionosphere. The soft X-rays from solar flares can interfere with radio wavelength signals traveling through the ionosphere. Before this experiment, which is flown on two previous CubeSats, soft X-rays had not been studied before. This experiment will also help scientists explain how the sun's outer atmosphere, or corona, is heated. Also on February 14th, a Russian Soyuz 2.1B launched the Progress MS-19 spacecraft towards the ISS from Site 316 at the Balkanur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, marking the 418th launch from that pad since 1961.
Just under nine minutes after launch, the spacecraft was separated from the Soyuz third stage and began its two-day flight to the ISS. Crewed Soyuz takes the fast track, but supplies can take their time. Progress MS-19 is the 80th Progress spacecraft to visit the International Space Station and the 172nd overall since the first one visited Salyut 6 in 1978. Progress MS-19 is loaded with 2,523 kilograms of cargo. This includes 1,500 kilograms of supplies and experiments for the Russian segment of the station. Some of these include the biodegradation experiment, which will investigate the breakdown of microscopic organisms on materials and their effect on the structural stability of the material. Another is Biomodule, which will investigate producing food and oxygen from the spirulina algae. The rest of the cargo is 431 kilograms of propellant for the station's engines and 421 liters of water for the life support system, which, because it is in the rational measurement system, weighs 421 kilograms. Rounding out the supplies is 40 kilograms of nitrogen for the station's atmosphere. MS-19 also contains six CubeSats, RadioScaf 10 through 17, designed and built by the Southwestern State University in Russia. These will be deployed from the ISS by hand during a spacewalk. Progress MS-19 will spend a record 370 days docked to the International Space Station, providing occasional reboots to the station's orbit before deorbiting itself over the South Pacific. And now for an update on last week's What's Up. It turns out that the piece of space junk that's going to hit the moon next month is not, in fact, a Falcon 9 upper stage, but is in f actually the third stage from the Long March 3 Bravo that launched the Chang'e 5T1 spacecraft towards the moon in 2014. The story, we find, the story behind the revised identity of the stage goes as follows. Back in late 2014, an object was spotted near the moon days after the launch of the Discover spacecraft, at the right time and brightness to be expected for the Falcon 9 upper stage. At the time, that was good enough to label it as the second stage from that launch. Flash forward to this month. Bill Gray, the person who identified the object as the Discover stage in 2015, received an email from a scientist at JPL. The object expected to the moon couldn't be the Discover stage because the Discover spacecraft itself was in a completely different part of the sky at the time, and the upper stage couldn't wouldn't be in a vastly different location. Bill went back to London in 2015 to see if any of them could be the mystery object. It needed to be bright and launched just after March 2015. Chunga 5T1's third stage fit the bill. He ran the orbit back to just after launch and saw that it started in China and flew very close to the moon only a few days after launch, closer than to the stage from Discover. As well, one of the secondary payloads has its own set of training data and it was very close, too. One of the interesting things about the stage, and one that even amateurs could investigate, was to receive radio signals from a payload on the derelict upper stage. It was called the Manfred Memorial Moon Mission, and it was a 14-kilogram payload with a radio beacon and radiation sensor permanently fixed onto the third stage. The radiation sensor broke 215 hours into flight, but the beacon worked. Amateur radio operators tracked the stage by using the Doppler shift of its signal until 14 days after launch, 100 hours longer than it was expected to last. A total of 75 operators received signals from the spacecraft. The mistaken identity of the stage would have been noticed earlier, but debris in lunar crossing orbits doesn't bother anyone except asteroid surveys, so no one bothered to calculate its orbit. Also, they're harder to track than ob objects closer to Earth, even though they're bigger than the 10 centimeter objects the Space Force usually tracks. In this case, the object literally slipped beneath the radar. So where is that second stage that launched Discover? It's probably in solar orbit. Objects can't stay in Lagrange 1, where Discover is without repulsion, 
and the stage was drained of fuel and power only hours after launch. So it probably sailed right through L1 and now goes directly around the sun. MIT's Kavli Institute for Astrophysics and Space Research recently announced that the TESS Object of Interest Catalog, or TOI Catalog, has passed 5,000 planet candidates, with most of this recent batch coming from the faint star search. Currently, the TESS mission is in its first extended mission, which is expected to run until at least 2025, and their catalog of candidates has more than doubled in the past year. Joining us now is Catherine Hess the TOI manager for the test mission. Thank you for joining us, Catherine, and welcome. Thanks, great to be here. So what is what does a TOI manager do for the test mission? All right, well, there are a bunch of different portions to it, but um, the biggest portion is the vetting. So what we do is we need to review all of the um, transit signals that test finds and decide if they look like planets or not. So, um, yeah, test will flag anything that any star that has a transit. So what that means is a planet passes in front of the star and covers its surface for a bit and causes a reduction in brightness. Mm -hmm. And some of these are from planets. Some of them could be from other things like eclipsing binaries, or it could be stellar variability. So what our job is with the vetting team is to determine if those look like planetary signals or if they are non-planetary. So is this done by a machine learning algorithm or is this done by A combination of both. So um, <laughs> both pipelines, QLP and Spock. Um, so we have the Quick Look pipeline based at MIT and then we have Spock, which is the Science Processing Operations Center that produces reports at uh, NASA AIM. Uh, both of them use different uh, pipelines to process the data, and part of it is machine learning based. But basically, the goal is to get rid of all the obvious false positives, and then mm -hmm. any signals that are left over that look like likely planet candidates are passed on to us, and that's where the vetting team comes in. So the vetting team consists of um, volunteers scientists that are experienced with looking at exoplanets and recognizing what those signals might look like versus non-planetary ones. And um, how it works is I upload the um, signals onto our vetting website tab, which is the test exoplanet vetting site. And then each of the signals is reviewed by three of the expert vetters individually. And then um, from that point, if any of the three vetters thinks that the signal looks like a planet, we pass it on to group vetting, where we meet as a group of three experienced vetters and talk about if we think that is a planet or not, and if we want to alert it as a TOI or test object of interest. So I... Unlike the Kepler program, where the Kepler planets, they go from KOIs to a Kepler planet and they change designation, the TOIs do not change designation if they're confirmed, correct? Uh, yeah, that's correct. So there's, they're still in the TOI catalog. Um, we do have a category for um, test confirmed planets now. So those are confirmed planets we found with tests. Um, in vetting, we'll also know um, known planets, which are confirmed planets prior to tests. But uh, yeah, there are many. Uh, how many confirmed planets are there for, for tests right now? For tests, I believe there are 180, about. OK, so there are 5,000 candidates, more than 5,000 candidates, and there are Correct. 180 confirmed out of that. How long is it going to take you guys to get through those other 4,800 planet candidates? Yeah, it takes a while. Uh, the follow-up is really something done by um, other groups outside of um, MIT. So uh, TFOP is the Test Follow-Up Observing Program. And they look at all of these TOIs that we alert, and they check them out and see if they seem like they're um, planets or not. So they use uh, ground-based telescopes and other um, 
observations to follow those up and to try to make sure they're on target, that they're not eclipsing binaries or anything else. And do you have sort of a, an approximate time as to how long it takes an object of interest sort of to go through the whole process? Um, yeah, so the, the reports are, so we get new data every month and it is kind of delayed by about a month. So it probably takes the next month to get it through vetting and then to be alerted. We're pretty much um, on time with alerting once we get the new data. Um, so there's pretty much like a month delay or so between when the data drops and when we can get it out to the public. Um, but yeah, the follow-up kind of has a more varied time span <laughs> because it right. depends kind yeah. of on how exciting the target is, what resources <laughs> are available, um, a lot of different factors. So, so when you say that these are volunteer scientists involved, are, are we talking citizen scientists or actual scientists who are volunteering their time to work on this particular project? Yeah, so for um, for the vetting team, primarily the latter, uh, we do have some uh, earlier on science career mm -hmm. students. Um, so we have we have a few uh, high schoolers that have actually joined the team recently. <laughs> But uh, we try to find people with some sort of exoplanet background just mm -hmm. because it's a lot more helpful and there's a lot less that has to be um, done in training for people that are pretty familiar with what transits are like and possible non-planet like characteristics. But, so for the follow-up observations, do can citizen scientists come in on that aspect of it? Um. That is a good question. I believe uh, there are a bunch of people that work on the follow up and that it is open to the wider community and kind of anyone that um, applies to be part of the TFOP um, program and has access to a telescope where they can get these follow up observations. Okay, so one one last tiny, tiny question. I know we talked about this beforehand and I don't want to don't want to press you too much, but a lot of the candidates that pushed the catalog past 5,000 came from the faint star search. What is that program? Yeah, so basically what happens is for the QLP pipeline, which is the Eclipse pipeline, and that's the one based at MIT that I work more closely with, um, because we're looking at the full field of all the different stars, there are so many. So even though Tess can um, observed targets down to a magnitude of 13.5. In uh, the nominal vetting for the mission, we've only been vetting targets of uh, 10.5 and brighter. So mm -hmm. what uh, the faint star search does is it's led by uh, Michelle Kinomoto and Tanzi Dan, who are two postdocs at MIT. And they are kind of reviewing all of these signals that we didn't look at in the original vetting that were missed and seeing if we can find planets around those signals. Wow, this seems like there's this is a, a fantastic mission. Obviously, I mean, I was always, I was excited when it launched. I'm excited to see data coming in, but it feels like this is also one of those missions where so many people are involved in just processing the data. It's fantastic. Um, thank you so much, Catherine. It has been great having you here today. So, so thank you again for joining me and talking about NASA and TESS. Yeah, definitely happy to be here. It's a great team to be a part of. This has been The Daily Space. To all of you watching on Now Media, this conversation ran longer than we can air. You can catch the full interview in its entirety on our website, dailyspace.org. While you're there, check out our show notes to find more information on all our stories, including images. As always, we're here thanks to the donations of people like you. Miss an episode? Go check it out wherever you get podcasts. Every episode is released, Apple, Google, even Spotify. Wherever you get podcasts, you can find Daily Space.